Hi everybody, welcome to my homestead and welcome to my channel. My name is Jared. In this video, I want to share an email sent to me by Jamie Butler, something that she says that uh, Elder Suarez said. And then the main topic of the video is going to be more about the um, fallen angels, watchers, Nephilim, so on and so forth. I already did a video about this, but somebody sent me a really good source of information that comes from the Ensign. It looks like this has already been addressed in the Ensign, which actually uh, doesn't surprise me. I'm, you know, with this channel, <clears throat> I, I don't know how it keeps happening, but it's pretty apparent to me that there are so many things that have already been said, things that have been interpreted or prophecies that I had no idea about. Uh, for example, that prophecy that Joseph Smith uh, did about the... Um, the United Kingdom and Russia. I had no idea until I did that video that that even existed. So it, it, it makes me wonder how many more things am I going to find during the course of this channel? I have no idea, but um, the way things are trending, it seems like there's a whole lot more out there. And this is just another one of them. So, and the reason why uh, I place emphasis on the Ensign church materials is because they go through the correlation process. The church doesn't just publish things that are other people's opinions. When something goes into an officially published church, um, church material or uh, whatever, it goes through that correlation to committee, committee to make sure that it's doctrinally sound. So even though it's an article by uh, Hugh Nibley, it's not just like his opinion. It, he's not saying anything in there that would go against church doctrine. So I'm going to show you what he said. But first, let's go to Jimmy Butler. She says, hi, Jared. I just um, I just about shouted for joy today when I heard this. So in Sunday school today, Brother Ellis, our elders quorum president, told us something that Elder Suarez, the apostle, told them in a regional leadership meeting yesterday in Twin Falls, Idaho, where I live. Oh, that's where my uh, sister-in-law lives. Uh, she doesn't go to church, though, so you probably don't know her. Well, maybe you know her. I don't know. Uh, Elder Suarez told them at the meeting that, quote-unquote, the second coming is very near. There you go. And uh, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't surprise me. Um, it feels like everybody is on board with that. And when I say everybody, I mean the first presidency and the apostles. And you can tell by... The talks that they give in conference, you can tell by the articles that they write in the Liahona and other church uh, material. It's pretty, it's pretty clear. It is pretty clear. And here's just another bit of evidence. Of course, we're taking your word for it, but I'm not, I, I believe you. I do. Okay. And then Jamie says, he also gave them four ways to prepare for it. Okay. For the second coming. Number one, study the atonement. Number two, teach pure doctrine. Number three, base all teachings on the scriptures and words of modern day prophets. Yes. And number four, teach by the spirit. I think number three is very important. Uh, we need to stick to, you have to stick to um, authoritative sources and those sources are scriptures, modern day prophets. I would also add church materials because I read something earlier in the channel where, um, at the, I think at the time it was Elder M. Russell Ballard. He was on the correlation committee, and <clears throat> in his, um, I can't remember if it was just like a talk or an article, but he was saying how he really wished that people uh, in church, when, when teaching lessons, would first stick to uh, the manual for, for the class, and then after that, if they felt like they needed to pull in other material, go to church uh, published material, just because he he knew how stringent uh, the correlation process is. And there's a lot of time that goes into that. And it, it's really trustworthy material because there's like a tendency to kind of like go outside. Now, bear in mind with me saying this, I'm doing a YouTube channel, but remember that this is not a church calling um, I'm not trying to teach lessons. I'm trying to just explore what's out there, both church news and also watching things that are happening in the world and also finding these just like hard to find or little known articles or prophecies and stuff and bringing that to mind. And then just kind of considering different possibilities. This is not a church class. This is YouTube. So um, please never say that I'm like teaching lessons or 
teaching because that's not really the intent. It's just exploring together. Okay, but anyway, and then uh, <clears throat> to finish off, I uh, just wanted to share that with you as I know you believe it's so close. Such an exciting thing to hear uh, that an apostle said. Keep doing what you're doing as you gather Israel. Thanks, Jared. Yes, now see, even though this is not a church calling, I'm not intending to do to like replace Sunday school or anything like that. I do. I do hope that I'm gathering Israel in some way. I would love to find out at some point that maybe someone came to the church or maybe moved on to the next step. Maybe someone that was like dragging their feet on going to the temple or whatever, or just generally helping raise awareness about uh, the time that we're in and that we're so close. Um, I think it helps. You know, one thing that really helps is that I have all this time and I feel like I've been given this opportunity. Um, and it's come through a very specific process, by the way. But I have all this time to where I can devote all my time to doing this and then putting all these things together that are hard to find, which give us a clear picture of what's going on. Um, so anyway, okay, so thank you, Jamie Butler. That is awesome. The second coming is very near. Okay, now I got another email. This is from Matt L., Jared, I want to I want to say thank you for your videos. Always an interesting topic. In relation to the Watchers video, I wanted to send out some information in case you weren't aware. I didn't see you address it in your video. Hugh Nibley did a whole series on the Book of Enoch that was published in different months of the Ensign in 1976, titled A Strange Thing in the Land. He addresses who the Watchers, Fallen Angels, Sons of God, Nephilim, etc. are, uh, the whole series is an interesting read, but this part in particular can be found under the heading The Wicked World of Enoch. Link below. Just just thought I'd forward it forward in case you weren't aware. Thanks, Matt L. All right. Thank you, Matt. Now, before I dive into the article, um, there was some discussion about, well, you know, maybe the, the, the fallen angels, maybe the watchers were actually like um, people from other worlds that had not reached the celestial kingdom. And so they were like terrestrial or telestial beings that had physical bodies. Um, so there was, there was that kind of idea, which, um, you know, I'm not, I can't like authoritatively really say anything, but what I can say is I, I don't think that that's a possibility because, uh, Christ is the one that made, uh, resurrection possible. So if someone from another world, had already gone through their mortal experience, I don't think that they would have been resurrected to a telestial or terrestrial glory uh, until Christ himself had actually performed the atonement. And at the time of Genesis and uh, Enoch and stuff like that, we, I mean, obviously Christ had not come to perform that mission yet, so I don't think that that's a possibility. Um, others had suggested that maybe, you know, there's multiple Christs on other worlds, and I don't think that that's the case. Uh, the reason why, uh, let me just sh share a couple things here. Uh, this one is from, this is actually President Nelson, but at the time, Elder Nelson, in October 1996, General Conference. Uh, he says here, And the mercy of the atonement extends not only to an infinite number of people, but also to an infinite number of worlds created by him. Uh, there's also this fair um, Latter-day Saint uh website right here that addresses this question, is Jesus Christ the Savior of other worlds? And so if you want to dig deeper into it, I'm sure maybe you already have, you can look at this uh, as a starting point. Um, so I, I do not think that, like, we, we know, okay, so we, we know that our Heavenly Father went through a similar process, right? Um, he himself did exactly what we're doing, and he gained exaltation. And uh, I'm not going to say authoritatively, but I can only assume that probably for his generation, there was probably a savior. And then for us, uh, not only us on this earth, but every the, the entire universe that belongs to our Heavenly Father, Christ is a savior for this entire universe. That's my That's my best understanding of it, and it seems to be the consensus, uh, between everything that I read. Um, I can't say that for sure though. So I, I don't know. 
but so so anyway as far as that goes i'm not gonna tell you what to think but as far as the watchers go i do not think that they were resurrected beings okay um the other possibility was brought up that maybe they were they were actually um neanderthals like the the daughters of the sons of god uh mixed with neanderthals and that frankly that makes sense to me i'm not saying that that's my main theory but i think there could be a lot of things we don't know um when i read some of the earlier well i'm not sure if i would say earlier but i, I know that i've like seen bruce r mcconkey he seemed to kind of re refute the idea of evolution um as far it, from what I can tell, the church doesn't have an official stance when it comes to that. And, and it does seem that we believe that this earth was probably created somewhat how uh, science how science portrays it, uh, rather than literal 24, 6, 24 hour periods. Um, anyway, I don't mean to go too deep down that rabbit hole. I, I It's not going to bother me either way. If we find out that the Earth was created in a literal six days, fine. Uh, if it was created over billions of years, fine. Um, it doesn't really matter to me. And I don't see it as a problem either way. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if, ev if evolution is partially true or maybe all the way true. Maybe, uh, Although it, it does seem like there's been some pretty strong statements about Adam and Eve literally being the first um, human beings. Uh, although, you know, when we, when we start talking about Neanderthals, maybe there was like a parallel species close enough to which, uh, we could interbreed and maybe, maybe there's more to it. I, I don't know. I don't know. So that's a possibility, but, um, whatever the case, it seems pretty clear that the sons of God, according to the book of Moses, and you'll have to go back to my last video about the watchers, Nephilim. It seems that the sons of God in the book of Moses, in our Pearl of Great Price, are the patriarchs and righteous men of that line, whereas their daughters married uh, men of the world, the sons of men, men of the world, men that are not of the covenant. And that's what the problem was, is that there was intermarriage between different beliefs and um exaltation was being lost essentially so so okay so let's go ahead and let's dive into this article a strange thing in the land the return of the book of enoch part eight and i was only vaguely aware that there was something like this because i i had heard of this before a strange thing in the land i didn't realize maybe that it was part of a a big series like this so Maybe we'll have to come back to this and check out some of the other parts. So this is by Hugh Nibley, Professor Emeritus of Ancient Scripture at Brigham Young University. Um, I have not read this. I know that bothers some people, but that's just how I do it. Here we go. The purpose of these articles is, one, to call attention to some of the long-ignored aspects of the Joseph Smith account of Enoch in the Book of Moses and in the inspired version of Genesis, and two... To, pro to provide, at the same time, some of the evidence that establishes the authenticity of that remarkable text. Um, contemporary learning offered few checks to the imagination of Joseph Smith. The enthusiasm of his followers presented none. Yet, though free to roam at will over a boundless plain, the prophet never once in his account of Enoch strays from the narrow and exacting path that later Enoch texts have so clearly marked. So basically, Joseph Smith didn't make it up. Like he he could have gone any number of ways uh, when it comes to uh, what we have in the book of Moses and um, Joseph Smith translations, but it seems to actually match up with the book of Enoch. Okay, so in his version, every essential element of the Enoch story as we now know it, turns up. Yet he never strays out of bounds. Uh, what he says and what he does does not uh, does not say about Enoch are equally remarkable considering his situation. To present and discuss all the ancient parallels to the Joseph Smith Enoch 
uh, would require a work of immense scope, but such is not necessary for our purpose. It is enough to show by one or two examples in each case that even the most extravagant passages in the Joseph Smith version may be matched by ancient texts. The prophet is never alone. Many important questions, such as the real age of the Enoch tradition, how the various texts are related, their relevance to modern life, etc., must be left till later. For the present, the message, the message and the bona fides of the Joseph Smith account of Enoch are our sole concern. Surprisingly enough, the best documented story of a clash between Adam and Satan is the scene in heaven. Uh, one old writing with unusually good cred credentials that trace back to the books deposited by the apostles in the first church archives in Jerusalem is the Coptic uh, discourse of the uh, discourse of the Abaton, a sermon based on the text delivered by Timothy, the Archbishop of Alexandria. The book belongs to the forty day literature. And as it opens, the Lord, on his last day on earth with the apostles just before his ascension, asks them if there is any final request they would like to make of him, exactly as in Third Nephi chapter 28, verse 1. Uh, what they want most is to understand the role of death and its horrors in God's plan for his children. To explain this, the Lord tells them of the council in heaven in the pre-existence where the plan of the creation is being discussed. There was great reluctance among the hosts among the hosts to proceed with the creation of the earth, the earth itself complaining uh, exactly in the manner of Moses chapter seven verse forty eight, which is such an interesting thing uh, that we know in our church is that it, it it seems that the earth itself is alive and has a spirit. Let's read that scripture. It says, And it came to pass that Enoch looked upon the earth, and he heard a voice from the bowels thereof, saying, Woe, woe is me, the mother of men. I am pained. I am weary because of the wickedness of my children. Uh, when shall I rest and be cleansed from the filthiness which has gone forth out of me? When will my Creator sanctify me that I may rest, and righteousness for a, section, for a season abide upon my face? Okay. So, Let's see, the earth itself complaining exactly in the manner of Moses 748 of the filthiness and corruption that would surely go out of her and begging to be allowed to rest from such horrors. And uh, I think we all kind of feel the same way right now, even though we're not, well, I guess half of you are literally the mother, <laughs> the mothers of men and daughters. Um, but I know that we're all so tired we're so tired. We're so tired as things just get worse and worse in this world. And uh, it's interesting that President Nelson, uh, he addresses this in conference. Let me pull it up. Uh, I guess I'll have to zoom out. He addresses this, if you'll remember, I think this was in his main talk, the 18-minute talk. Let me find it. Yeah, that that look at that. That's the name of the talk: overcome the world and find rest. And there's a part in here where he says, "And yes, rest." He says, "As you let God prevail in your life, I promise you greater peace, confidence, joy." And then his body language. You have to watch his body language as he gives his talks, because at this point he smiles and he looks at the congregation and says, "And yes, rest." This is something that we all want. We want the rest of not being around so much wickedness and uh, wickedness always being shoved in our faces. And uh, this is an interesting thing here as we think about this, because I, I wonder if this kind of correlates to this. You know, the earth is talking about when am I going to have my, my uh, season of peace, M meaning the millennium. You know, I, I think that it would be referring to basically the the millennium here. Let me pull. Let me actually pull up the actual scripture and see if uh, there's like a footnote. Uh, no, there's no footnote. But the earth says, when will my creator sanctify me that I may rest in righteousness for a season, for a season abide upon my face? That sounds to me like the millennium. 
so that that might be significant that president nelson was kind of talking about this because we are even though we can have rest now by letting god prevail we will definitely have rest when the millennium comes okay let's continue on um because of the council's reluctance to proceed God allows the lifeless body of Adam to lie upon the earth for 40 days, unwilling without the council's approval to let his spirit enter. The Son of God saves the day by offering to pay the price for whatever suffering will be entailed, uh, thus permitting God's children to return again to their former condition. Christ alone thus becomes the author of our earthly existence. Amid joy and rejoicing, God calls for a book in which he registers the names of all the quote, sons of God who are to go to earth. See, and this right here is basically referencing how there was organization before this uh, mortality, that there was Israel in the pre-existence, there were different classes of people, the great ones, right? Um, okay, this, of course, is the heavenly book of the generations of Adam upon or, sorry, Generations of Adam open at the foundation of the earth, the book to which Enoch refers so explicitly in Moses 6, 46 and 8. Let's see, it says, For a book of remembrance we have written among us, according to the pattern given by the finger of God, and it is given in our own language. Now, this prophecy Adam spake as he was moved upon by the Holy Ghost, and a genealogy was kept of the children of God, and this was the book of the generations of Adam, saying, in the day that God created man, in the likeness of God, made he him. Okay. Um, in the presence of all the hosts, Adam is next made ready to take over his great assignment. He is placed on a throne and given a crown of glory and a scepter. And all the sons of God bow the knee first to God the Father, then to Adam the Father, in, recogni in recognition of his, of his being in God's exact likeness and image. Satan, however, refuses to comply, uh, declaring that he is willing to worship the Father, but not Adam. Quote, It is rather he that should worship me, for, our, for I arrived before he did. Interesting. Um, so, and, and, then he, and then he nibbly references Moses 1, 19. And now when Moses had said these words, Satan cried with a loud voice and ranted upon the earth and commanded, saying, I am the only begotten, worship me. Which I, you know, it seems like maybe there's a thing there. We know that he's a son of the morning, which from what I've seen is kind of interpreted as being, he was one of the earlier sons of God in this, uh, being, you know, born, uh, spiritually begotten, um, spiritually born, whatever, created. And maybe he felt like he had a right because he, he was one of the older ones. Okay, God saw that Satan, because of his boundless ambition and total lack of humility, could no longer be trusted with celestial power and commanded the angels to, to remove him from his office. This ordinance they performed with great sorrow and reluctance. They, quote, removed the writing of authority from his hand. They took from him his armor and all the insignia of priesthood and kingship, end quote. Then, with a ceremonial knife, a sickle, they afflicted upon him certain ceremonial blows of death, which deprived him of his full strength forever after. Other accounts say that after uh, these cuts, he retained only one third of his former power, uh, even as he followed by, even as he was followed <clears throat> by one third of the hosts. Next. Adam was escorted to earth to enter his mortal body, and for a hundred years thereafter was often visited by angels. Thereafter, two hundred years he lived happily in innocence with Eve, taking good care of the animals in his charge. Eventually, Satan succeeded in getting possession of a mortal creature, uh, which enabled him to carry on an extensive campaign aimed at Eve. Adam was greatly upset. But when Eve, the victim of a trick, took all responsibility, he joined her. Satan stopped Adam outside the garden and gloatingly told him that uh, told him that this was the sweet revenge for Adam's victory in heaven. Adam had got expelled from heaven, and now he had, he had paid him in kind. 
uh, what was more, he intended to continue his project. Quote, I will never cease to contend against thee and against all those who shall come after thee from out of thee until I, until I have taken them all down to perdition. With the threat of death before him, Adam saw the bitterness of hell, uh, but call, calling upon God, he received not only the assurance of salvation for the dead through the atonement of Christ, but is told that death shall be sweet to those whose names are inscribed in the book of life. Fear of death, uh, the angel Moriel, okay, fear of death, the angel Moriel, in parentheses, is wholesome and necessary to remind the human race of its fragility and constant need of repentance. This has the salutary effect of countering Satan's plan by providing a constant check on the tendencies of men to misbehave, a sobering and, if necessary, a frightening lesson. Uh, what comes after the showdown between our first parents and the adversary? Our sources ob obligingly go right on with, with the story and follow Satan from his attempts to win Adam's obedience to his highly successful interviews with Cain, tracing the steady spread of wickedness among mankind down to its culmination in the days of Enoch. Uh, there is no better summary on the story than that given in the book of Moses, which is surprisingly close to the quote-unquote combat of Adam version on every point. Let us briefly survey events leading up to the call of Enoch as given in the Joseph Smith account. Having been instructed by an angel of the Lord, Adam and Eve enjoyed a fullness of the gospel, quote, and they made all things known unto their sons and their daughters. Uh, enter Satan, the negative one, with his non-gospel, quote, believe it not, uh, end quote, and his counter-gospel, quote, I am also the son of God, end quote. He gains a following by pushing downhill in the direction of that, in the direction of what is carnal, sensual, and devilish. This called for such preaching of repentance as Adam and Eve remained true and faithful and ceased not to call upon God. Into this world, Cain was born who rejected his parents' teachings as irrational. Quote, who was the Lord that I should know him? End quote. The Lord gave Cain every chance to be wise and save himself, showing him in all reasonable, reasonableness the dangerous course he was taking and warning him that uh, he would be in Satan's power to, to the degree that he refused, refused obedience. Quote, and thou shalt rule over him. Cain rule over Satan? Yes, that is the arrangement. The devil serves his client, gratifies his slightest whim, pampers his appetites, and is at his beck and call uh, throughout his earthly life, putting unlimited power and influence at his disposal through his command of the treasures of the earth, gold and silver. But in exchange for the victims, sorry, but in, in exchange, the victim must keep his part of the agreement following Satan's instructions on earth and remaining in his power the hereafter. That is the classic bargain, the pact with the devil, by which a, a Faust, Don Juan, Macbeth, or Jabez Stone achieve the pinnacle of earth, earthly success and the depths of eternal damnation. See, in that right there, this is the essence of secret combinations and Gadiant robbers, and it's always been ever since the time of Cain all the way until now. The Book of Mormon uh, talks about it extensively. And, um, you know, the, like, it's always been, and uh, they're attracted to places of power, because that, that's that's the, the promise, is that they'll have power. Satan can help them obtain power via secret combinations. Okay, people that work behind the scenes, uh, that are rich, that help each other out, um, using different methods to continue that. And you can see it out in the open, frankly, with uh, a lot of people have been commenting and emailing me stuff about, let's see, the Common Wealth Games opening ceremony. 
you know, just like the, just like the, what's it called? The Super Bowl and the Olympics, you know, when they have these like just horrible musical numbers and stuff, it, it's always very like nowadays, especially it's a very, very dark. It's really bad. Um, looks like the, this might be the, here, let me, uh, Like, look at this. This is awful. Look at that. D does that look good? No, it does not look good. Um, but there's more. I'm not going to analyze this because, you know, that's not really what my channel is or what it's about. But there is some really bad stuff in here. You know, you may or may not recognize some of these symbols like the bowl. Uh, this right here. They build it up and look. What what does this look like to you? What what Bible story does this look like to you? This shape. There's a famous painting. I can't remember the name of the painter, but um, you know, th this is kind of the shape that he depicted uh, the Tower of Babel, right? And this starts with like a, a star exploding and pieces falling to the earth, which um, typically is a symbol of Satan and those that have fallen with him and they pick up the pieces and they, I'm not going to analyze the whole thing, but there's all these different elements here. It's, it's awful. It's horrible. These are secret combinations and I'm not exactly sure why they put these things out in the open. It might be mockery. It could be a show of power. It could be a ritual of sorts. Um, but it's, look, there's like the, I think that's like checkerboard, pattern right there that's one of their favorite things um in one particular mystery school so anyway i just thought i'd point that out uh, watch at your own risk there's lots of other things like this like there was um what was the, there was like a opening ceremony ceremony bridge no 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 it was a tunnel uh was it in Switzerland? Yeah, 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 yeah. Look, look at this right here. This one was horrible. Oh, this wasn't even for, like, game. It wasn't for, like, sports or anything like that. It was the opening of a tunnel. And um, it is really bad. Uh, you <laughs> well, look at the preview here. Yeah, hopefully you can tell that this is really bad. <laughs> oh, it is super bad. These people are just the worst. They are the worst. And people that don't have eyes to see, they're just like, oh, it's just like modern art. It's just, you know, it's no big deal. No, it is a big deal. They're telling, they're basically telling you who they really are. It's like they're, they're showing that they can do this kind of thing and get away with it. You know, the world is like our society is so bad now that they can do these horrible performances and um, and just no one speaks up or tries to stop it or call it out. Oh, my gosh, it's so bad. It's so bad. OK, let's move on. Um, the Lord held forth the fatherly invitation to Cain. If thou doest well, thou shalt be accepted. Along with the solemn warning, Satan desireth to have thee. He is admonished against the folly of rejecting the greater counsel, and the door of repentance is held open to the last moment, uh, when it is Cain himself who breaks off the conversation and angrily stamps out, refusing to listen any more to the voice of the Lord or to his brother's remonstrances. Remonstrances? Uh, Cain married one of his brother's daughters, not necessarily Abel's, in parentheses, and together they loved Satan more than God. Uh, quite satisfied with their religion and quite defiant about it. Uh, what can be done in, in such a situation? Nothing. Y you guys, I promise this is getting to the fallen ones, the watchers, just, but th this is like the true, in, in my opinion, and I, I think that this is the church's view on it too, because they, again, this got put into the enzyme. This is really what we're talking about when we're talking about fallen angels, um, the Watchers, the Nephilim, you'll see. 
Okay, what could one do in such a situation? Nothing. Adam and his wife mourned before the Lord because of Cain and his brethren. Having deliberately severed all connection with his heavenly father, Cain was free to enter a formal agreement with Satan by which he would receive instruction in the techniques of achieving, achieving power and gain. Quote, For truly I am Mahan, the master of this great secret. The language... Uh, and then in brackets, the language is that of ancient colleges or guilds where the secret is the mystery of the trade or profession. In this case, his secret is how to convert life into property. And that's the end of the bracket that I may murder and get gain. Cain glorified, uh, sorry, Cain gloried, quote unquote, in the power of his newfound skill in dialect declaring that it made him, quote-unquote, free. Uh, he put his knowledge to work in a brilliantly successful operation in which, quote, Abel was slain by the C-word of his brother, end quote. A gleef and gleefully congratulated himself and gloried in that which he had done, saying, I am free. Surely the flocks my brother falleth into my hands. This new light on Cain's behavior is confirmed in the the combat of Adam. Um, I, I guess that's a part of the Book of Enoch. I'm not very familiar with the Book of Enoch, but I'm guessing that's like a section of it, the combat of Adam, where we learn that after killing Abel, Cain felt no inclination to repent of what he had done, a detail pointed, pointed out also by some of the early church fathers. Plainly, this is not the conventional novel of Cain and Abel, in which an uh, impetuous adolescent loses his head and brains, and brains his spoiled brother in a fit of jealousy. It is a carefully planned and executed operation in which Cain slew his brother Abel for the sake of getting gain, dismissing his conscience with the thought that uh, all was fair and square since Abel was quite capable of taking care of himself. Am I my brother's keeper? This was the philosophy by which Satan seduced the human race, teaching them th that, uh, quote, every man fared in this life according to the management of the creature. Therefore, every man prospered according to his genius and that every man conquered according to his strength. And whatsoever a man did was no crime. Yeah, that's horrible. You know what that's called? It's called the law of the jungle, the survival of the fittest. It's called the survival of the fittest. And, um, you know, that, that's basically the law by which the natural man operates. Right? The natural man, if you were just to, like, let your spirit take the back seat, uh, would become an animal and just only care about itself and its primary needs, food, shelter, uh, procreation, all those things being the, the top of the pecking order. And it doesn't matter how you do that, just as long as you succeed at doing that. Okay, so when God took a different view and called him to account, he still pleaded the prophet motive as an excuse. Satan tempted me because my brother's flocks. Uh, being shut out of the presence of the Lord, Cain started his own establishment, the main line of his descendants being Enoch, um, who built the city of Enoch, <clears throat> and by the way, this is a different Enoch. So there was an Enoch down uh, Cain's line, uh, not to be confused with the righteous Enoch. Um, so anyway, uh, his descendants being Enoch, who built a city of Enoch, Irad, uh, Mahujael, Methusael, L Lamech, the father of Jubal, and Tubal Cain. Lamech, like Cain, entered into a covenant with Satan and like him, became Master Mahan. When Lamech heard that Irad, the son of Enoch, was violating the secrecy of these terrible things, he slew him for the oath's sake, since Irad began to reveal unto the other sons of Adam these top-secret signs of recognition. All those who covenanted with Satan were excluded from the holy covenants of God, <clears throat> uh, though they pretended that everything was the same as before. The dirty business spread, as such things do do once started. Uh, Lamech became an outcast like Cain, 
not because of the murder, but because his wife started spreading his confidential secrets, the very ones he had murdered Irad for divulging. And thus the works of darkness began to prevail among all the sons of men, and God cursed the earth with a sore curse. Secret combinations. Secret combinations living this this worldly game of survival. And, um, you know, rising to the top. Is there no relief in the terrible picture? There is. All this time, the gospel was being declared by the holy angels and by the gift of the Holy Ghost. While all things were confirmed unto Adam by an holy ordinance, in the assurance that the gospel should be in the world until the end thereof, uh, Adam, having lost Abel, got another son, Seth, to carry on his work. From him comes the line of the the line of successors in the priesthood, duly registered in the Book of Life, from which the wicked were excluded. See, so there's there's like these two groups: the righteous and the wicked. Okay. Um, after Seth came Enos, who decided to make an important move. Since in those days Satan had great dominion among men and raged in their hearts, causing wars and bloodshed, in administering death because of secret words, works, seeking for power. Uh, exactly as the modern world, Enos gathered together the residue of the people of God, and with them migrated out of the country and dwelt in the land of promise. <laughs> okay, sorry. Um the the residue of the people and with them migrated out of the country and dwelt in the land of promise named Canaan after his son. Uh, the line is Seth, Enos, Canaan, Mahalil, Jared, uh, that's me, well that's my name, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, and Noah. Okay. In the combat of Adam with Satan as Migni or Minye uh, observes, quote, the author depicts the descendants of Adam as divided into two separate and distinct branches. The Cainites, dedicated to following Satan, who lived in a fertile country but very far distant from Eden, who devoted themselves to all the pleasures of the flesh and all manner of immorality, uh, and the Sethites, who dwelt in the mountains near the garden uh, where, uh, sorry, dwelt in the mountains near the garden, were faithful to the the divine law and bore the name of the son, bore the name of the sons of God. Okay, so they had this title, this name, the sons of God, which, which is very fitting because we know that we we know that that's a title that's associated with those that gain exaltation. That yes. Heavenly Father is the is the father of all his spirit children, but when we enter into covenants uh, and when we go to the temple, we become sons of God. We become uh, the sons of Christ. And, um, the children. Well, I can't remember exactly how it's said, but you know what I'm talking about. Um, so I feel like there's like a temple theme right here uh, in them having this name, the sons of God. Uh, the occurrence of like names in the two genealogies should not surprise anyone who does much genealogy, where the same family, the same family names keep turning up in an endless round. The thing to notice is that there are two lines, in that Enoch uh, is seen as a stranger and a wild man only when he leaves his native colony in Canaan, a land of righteousness unto this day to sojourn as a missionary among the wayward tribes. And so the stage is set for Enoch. The wicked world of Enoch. Okay, the wickedness of Enoch's day had a special stamp and flavor. Only the most determined and entrenched depravity merited the extermination of the race. In apocryphal Enoch stories, we are told how humanity was led to the extremes of misconduct under the tutelage of uniquely competent masters. According to these traditions, these were none other than special heavenly messengers who were sent down to earth to restore respect for the name of God among the degenerate human race, but instead yielded to temptation, misbehaved with the daughters of men, and ended up instructing and abetting their human charges in all manner of iniquity. Okay, so here 
here's where we're starting to talk about the fallen ones, the watchers. Okay. So, oh, and he says right here, they are variously de designated as the watchers, fallen angels, sons of God, Nephilim, or Rephaim, and are sometimes confused with their offspring, the giants. You'll recall that according to uh, some people's reading of the Book of Enoch, that they believe that physical angels that were in the presence of God came down and that they had offspring with human women. And so the offspring were hybrids and they had the, the characteristics of being giants. Okay. Now, we cleared that up by reading the book of Moses, where it talks about, no, the sons of God are the patriarchs in the righteous line. Those are the sons of God. Their daughters ended up marrying the, the sons of men or this other wicked branch of the human family. And that's what the problem was. And uh, you can see why there's confusion when it comes to other religions, because in other religions, they don't see angels as being the same species as us in our church that we are unique in that we view satan his followers um <clears throat> pre-existent visitors translated visitors resurrected visitors and human beings themselves all the same race we're all the same generation with heavenly father being all of our fathers and uh, when it comes to having a body you have to have come to earth right? And gone through the mortal, mortal process. <clears throat> and then after that, either you are translated like uh, the three Nephites, Elijah, uh, or you die and then later you're resurrected. That's the only way that you can have physical bodies. And <clears throat> back in those days, the only type of heavenly visitors that would have come would have been uh, pre-existent spirits, right? Because like I was saying earlier, there was no resurrection uh, to that point. They, they still had to wait all the way until Christ came in the meridian of time. Okay, so other candidates for this dubious honor have been suggested by various scholars. Uh, the trouble being that more than one category of beings qualify as fallen angels and spectacular sinners before the time of the flood. The Bible uses the, the title, quote-unquote, sons of God, um, <clears throat> were they different from the watchers of tradition? The sons of quote, the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair and they took them wives of all which they chose. Uh, there were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men and they bare to them, mighty men, men of renown. And God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth. End quote. The idea of intercourse between heavenly and earthly beings was widespread in ancient times. Thus, in the newly discovered Genesis uh, Apocryphon, when Lamech's wife bears him a super child, Noah, he assumes almost as a matter of course that the father is, quote unquote, one of the angels, and accuses her of faithful faithfulness until his grandfather, Enoch, whose lot is the holy ones, whose lot is the holy ones, and who lives far away, clears up the misunderstanding. Significantly, the name of the child's mother is Bit Enosh, i.e. she is one of the quote-unquote daughters of men. <clears throat> Sorry. The Sidrenus fragment avoids the problem of heavenly origin by identifying the sons of God and the daughters of men with the descendants of Seth and Cain, respectively. And he specifically designates the sons of God as the Watchers. Recently, M. Emanuele, M. <laughs> M. Emanuele has suggested that the various terms are merely, quote-unquote, uh, a figure of speech in order to express the depth of the deterioration of that generation. While the sons of God have been identified with both angels and the watchers, the Greek Enoch does not identify the watchers with Satan's hosts uh, who fell from heaven from the beginning. They are another crowd. 
so that's in the Greek. In the Greek, the watchers are not the same as Satan and his angels. In the Joseph Smith Enoch, which gives the most convincing solution, the beings who fell were not angels, but men who had become sons of God. From the beginning, it tells us mortal men could qualify as sons of God, beginning with Adam. Quote, Behold, thou, Adam, art one in me, a son of God, and thus may all become my sons. That's in Moses chapter 6, verse 68. How? By believing in entering the covenant. Quote, Our father Adam taught these things, and many believed and become the sons of God. Oh, well, there you go. This is where you find it. It's in it's in Moses. This is the definition of sons of God. Thus, when Noah and his sons hearkened unto the Lord and gave heed, they were called the sons of God. In short, the sons of God were those who accepted and who who accept and live the law of God. When the sons of men, as Enoch calls them, broke their covenant, they still insisted on that exalted title. Behold, we are the sons of God. Have we not taken unto ourselves the daughters of men? Even as the sons of men, reversing the order, married the daughters of those called the sons of God, thereby forfeiting their title for uh, said God to Noah, they will, they will not hearken unto my voice. The situation was then that the sons of God, or their daughters, who had been initiated initiated into spiritual order, departed from it um, and broke their vows, mingling with those who observed only a carnal law. Okay, so it wasn't <clears throat> it wasn't some kind of physical uh, angel that, according to this, okay, you believe what you want, but I feel like this makes the most sense that we're not having like sneaky angels from other planets coming here and um, interbreeding, right? It just, that doesn't sound right because I, I feel like that's not something that the Lord would allow or that some, somebody would be like once resurrected. Okay, there's there's already the resurrection problem that Christ had not performed the resurrection yet. But if somehow that was possible, like if time doesn't work the way that we think and um, I don't think that uh, one of those resurrected telestial or terrestrial people would be able to sneak their way over here and do this. It just, it just seems like too much of a disruption to the plan. And it just, sorry, it just doesn't make sense to me. Um, but it's okay. You can think whatever you want. Okay, so moving on. Uh, quote, why have you left heaven and the exalted one, says Enoch, in a, Giza frag in a Giza fragment, and with the daughters of men defiled yourselves? Have you behaved as the sons of the earth and begotten, your and begotten to yourselves giant sons? And you were once holy, spiritual, eternal beings and have lusted after the flesh, as do mortal and perishable creatures." What made the world of Enoch so singularly depraved as to invite total obliteration was the deliberate and systematic perversion of heavenly things to justify wickedness. Uh, an early Christian writer, uh, Hippolytus, Hippolytus <coughs> says, says that the Antichrist imitates Christ in every particular. Each sends out his apostles, uh, gives his seal to believers, does signs and wonders, claims the temple as his own, uh, has his own church and assembly, etc. Such is the method of the great deceiver of the world, uh, against whom Hippolytus, uh, against whom says Hippolytus, Enoch and Elias have warned us. We are reminded how Satan put forth his claim, I am also a son of God, and commanded Cain to make an offering unto the Lord and to take his, ho his oaths by the living God, as if everything were still in the proper order. In the same spirit, Noah's descendants and their wickedness still insisted that nothing had changed. The children of men said to Noah, 
Behold, we are the sons of God. Have we not taken unto ourselves the daughter, daughters of men? The Apocrypha agree. Uh, quote, For in the days of Jared, my father, they departed from the teaching of the Lord, from the covenant of heaven, and behold, they commit sin and reject the proper way and beget children not like spiritual but like carnal offspring. Sophisticated deception is the name of the game. Woe unto you who deliberately go astray, cries Enoch, who promote yourselves to honor and glory by deceitful practices, who misapply and misinterpret straightforward statements, who have given a new twist to the everlasting covenant, and then produce arguments to prove that you are without guilt. See, and this is the whole, this is the whole like wordplay game. Um, there's a lot of this that's going on right now in pop culture that misinterpret knowingly they misapply and they make bad things seem good. Like you're good if you do bad things. The, the whole calling uh, good evil and evil good and uh, using words. If we go to, let's see, 14 fundamentals of following the prophet. Um, I want to go to the church website, though. Let's see. LDS. Oops. Okay. <sighs> My gosh. LDS. 14 fundament fundamentals of following the prophet. Here we go. Liahona, June... 1981 this was issued or this was a, this is a message message from the first presidency and it gives you all the different issues that people have with following the prophet and one of them is argue about words okay number six the prophet does not have to say thus saith the lord to give us scripture sometimes there are those who argue about words and this kind of behavior right here. This is very much like the problem that Christ encountered when he came to his people that they had turned the commandments. They like took it from being like a spiritual thing and they made it more of like a legal thing, a thing where you know, you, you don't act according to the spirit of the law. You you just live by the letter of the law and see what you can get away with. So you don't transgress the law according to the word, but your heart's not really in it. And so that's why it's valuable to have doctors of the law, lawyers of the law, because they can tell you, oh, yeah, you can do this. Just don't do this. And that's not the point. That's not the point. That kind of behavior is not good. It's dead. You're you're not living the commandments because of what they were what they were originally given for. You're just like treating them like they're dead, and treating it like a lawyer, and that's what a lot of people do uh, with the prophet, and uh, kind of the same thing here. Um, just twisting things, twisting things to justify, twisting things to justify whatever it is that you're doing. Okay, it says here, cold-blooded calculation is the keynote. The watchers, using the Greek word, led away myriads of myriads uh, with our prince, Satan L, says the Slavonic Enoch, and defiled the earth by their acts. And the wives, instead of daughters of men, uh, did a great evil, violating the law, a great iniquity. For in the secret places of the earth... We read in a very Judeo-Christian source, they were doing evil, and all of them committed adultery with their neighbors' wives, and they made solemn covenants among themselves concerning these things. Such practices went back to the days of Cain. Um, so that here's like a table here, where, there, where there's like a comparison between the Book of Moses and the Apocrypha. <clears throat> so 
in Giza or Gize 6 2, the sons of heaven wish to break their covenants and join with the daughters of men. But Samizus, Satan, said, I, I am afraid you will not be willing to go through with this thing. And they answered him all, saying, We will all swear with an oath and bind each other by a moral cur- a mortal curse uh, that we will not go back on this agreement until we have carried it out. Uh, then they all swore together and pronounced the doom of death on each other. And then in Moses, it said, it says, The Lord cursed all them that had covenanted with Satan, for they kept not the commandments of God. And Satan said unto Cain, Swear unto me, and swear thy brethren, that they tell it not, for if they tell it, they shall surely die. For from the days of Cain, there was a secret combination, and their works were in the dark, and they knew every man his brother. Sorry, give me just one second. Okay. And then First Enoch 29, 13, Kazbiel, Kazbiel, uh, the chief of the oath, when he dwelt above in glory, requested Michael to show him the hidden name that he might enunciate in the oath so that those might quake before that name and oath who revealed all that was secret to the children of men. Enoch, first Enoch 69.1, uh, it was Gadriel who showed the children of men all the blows of death, and he led astray Eve. And then in Moses, chapter 5, verses 29 to 30, Satan said unto Cain, Swear unto me by thy throat, if thou tell it to thy if thou tell it, thou shalt die, and swear thy brethren by their heads, and by the living God, that they tell it not, for if they tell it, they shall surely die. In this thy that thy father may know it, and all these things were done in secret. Okay. Uh Ethiopian BK Mysteries PO four I don't know, four 431, whatever. Uh, In the days of Cain, evil and deceitful practices increased. The wicked angels set themselves up in open and insolent opposition to Adam, and glorying in their earthly bodies, learned a great sin, and openly exposed all the work which they had seen in heaven. Okay, in Moses, it says, And Adam and Eve ceased not to call upon God, but behold, Cain hearkened not, saying, Who is the Lord that I should know him? For from the days of Cain, there was a secret combination, and their works were done in dark. Or their works were in the dark. And so we find a great, we find in a Greek Enoch text, the great angels turning from earth to report to God that they had found Azael teaching all manner of unrighteousness upon the earth. And, uh, and he has laid bare those mysteries of the age which belong to heaven which are now known in practice among men. And also, Samiasis is with them, is with him. Uh, he to whom thou gavest authority over those who, who go along with him. So this is, this is interesting. An angel going back and reporting uh, that these things are being taught by Azael. Uh, and then, how we just read how they they attempt to do things in a counterfeit way, uh, almost as though, like like it said, almost as though things are still in order, but now they're in charge, or this is the way to do it. And um, we've talked about this group before. Give me just one second. I'll pull it up. I'll pull up the the Wikipedia article. We've talked about this group before, and. Um, I frankly believe there are many, many good ones of these. In fact, the church has a video on YouTube. Um, Elias. Was Joseph Smith? So you should check this out if you haven't. I know that this, you know, gives some people a problem because they're like, oh, what? He did that, and he was part of that group. Because uh, they don't have a very good reputation, right? Especially when you learn about secret combinations and stuff like that. I think at the base level down here, they're very, very good men. In that there's a lot of good things that are taught here. Um, when you go up toward the top, 
not so much. It gets worse. It gets more secretive and um, actual secret combinations are carried out. That, that That's just based on my entire history of studying this topic. But some people just look at this up here and they're like, oh, this whole thing is bad. Um, it's just like the scriptures, right? Joseph Smith uh, didn't write the Bible. None of our prophet, prophets wrote the Bible. The Bible has been handed down through time and things have been corrupted in it, mistranslated, things have been taken out, um, so on and so forth. Uh, I think it's the same thing with this. Okay. I think it's the same thing with this in that some, some things were pres preserved through time and, um, and we have those things now. And that's why there's a similarity. That's why there's a similarity. But it's interesting because we read in... Um, let me see if I can remember which one it was. Let's go here. The channel. Playlists. By the way, I narrowed down my playlist. So um, go to the three Nephites. There was one of these... I think it was a strange personage. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it was a strange personage where this is a story of presumably one of the three Nephites, and he was actually preaching against this, how this had through time become corrupted. But he didn't say that the things that they taught necessarily were bad, or but there he was saying that basically this organization had become corrupted over time. So it, it's interesting. I don't mean to go too far into that, into that topic, but anyway. Okay. So, um, as bad as breaking their oaths was divulging them to those not worthy to receive them, thereby debasing and invalidating them. One of the most widespread themes of myth and legend is the tragedy of the hero who, who yields to the charms of a fair maiden or femme fatale, femme, femme fatale and ends up revealing to her hidden mysteries. The story meets the story meets us in the oldest Egyptian epic where the lady Isis wheedles out of Ray the fatal knowledge of his true name and in like tales of Samson and Delilah the daughters of Jared, uh, Lohengrin, etc., in which the woman is the Pandora who must know what is in the box. On this theme, the, the Gizeh fragments offer a significant parallel to the Joseph Smith version, in which the common background of the text and the confusion of the Latter-day scribes are equally apparent. In Moses, it says, Lamech had spoken the secret unto his wives, and they declared these things abroad, and had not compassion, and thus darkness began to prevail among the sons of men. Okay, compare that to Giza or Gize 16 verses 2 through 4. And now concerning the watchers, say to them, You were in heaven, and there you knew every mysterian, which had not been made known to you, as well as that mystery which God allowed, and that you disclosed your what you disclosed to your wives in the hardness of your heart, and it was through this mystery that women and men caused iniquities to abound upon the earth. Um, Clement of Alexandria... Okay, I'm actually going to end it here, because now this is getting kind of long, so you can finish the rest of it if you want. We're pretty close to the end, but hopefully this kind of like opens your eyes a little bit when it comes to the Watchers, uh, I, I feel like there's a lot of times where instead of doing the research within our own church and what's already been said in church materials, whether it's the Ensign, Lehona, um, church, just church publications, general conference, even the scriptures themselves, looking at like the footnotes, Joseph Smith translations and stuff like that, instead of like digging deep enough into that, we look at other traditions. You know, I'm all about looking at other traditions. Uh, again, I speak with an Orthodox rabbi in Israel every other week because I'm trying to learn more about Judaism, how they view things, and just understand them better, and then relay some of that information to you. I'm all about 
understanding what Catholics believe, evangelicals, um, just all that. But I think we got to be careful in adopting those beliefs and those interpretations, because uh, especially when it comes to Christianity, modern day Christianity, because they, they have very fundamental uh, differences from us when it comes to how they how they conceptualize uh, the heavens, for example, the nature of God, his body, Christ, the Holy Ghost, angels, um, as well as the, uh, the, the great apostasy, which gives rise to the idea of a one person antichrist and all sorts of things. So they're doing the best that they can with what they have. I, I understand why they, they look at the Book of Enoch, and a lot of them accept it. And so they look at the Book of Enoch through their lens in how they understand heaven, right? And so they're like, oh, yeah, okay, that makes sense. Because, again, we are fundamentally different in the way that we view Satan. We view Satan as a spiritual brother, although he's been cast out, and that's what happened. We're part of the same generation and the same species, whereas Christians, other Christians, they view us as creatures of God. God is like singular. There's only that. That's it. And then after under him is angels and they are some other type of species or creature. And then we are under that and that and we're above the animals, essentially. So you can see how that would cause problems. Like if you're listening to them and they're they're interpreting the Book of Enoch or, or other things, you have to be super careful because at a very deep level, we have big differences when it comes to this kind of stuff. Um, yeah, okay. That's going to be it for this one. So I hope you enjoyed it. Um, if you haven't already, please make sure to subscribe, like this video if you liked it, leave your thoughts and opinions down in the comments below. Also make sure to share it, and I will talk to you guys later.